Welcome to Dayspring Fellowship. Thank you for choosing to join us today as we look to connect with the presence of God and allow Him to do His good work in us. He loves doing something new in each one of us. And just between you and me, I love it when He lets me in on exactly what He's doing. But whether He's working behind the scenes of your life or allowing you to get a glimpse of it, His work is always good. I'm Chris Voigt, and I lead the team here at Dayspring. We have an incredible team of people who work tirelessly to help people grow. That's what we're all about, getting to know God better as we surrender more of our lives to Him and live out His love in relationship with each other. If you're visiting Dayspring today, we want you to know that we are a come-as-you-are kind of church. There's no need to pretend that you've got your act together. We don't. We have messy lives that we are allowing Jesus to bring wholeness and healing to. And we're working through our messes together. There's always room for someone new. Even if you haven't bought into this whole Jesus thing yet, or are skeptical about church or the Bible, wherever you are, we'd love to meet you there and walk with you as you figure it out. We're all on a journey, and wherever you are on your journey, welcome. You can learn more about us as a church by exploring our website at dsf.church, by checking out our Facebook page, or contacting us by phone or email. If you need help figuring out the next step to making Dayspring your home church, or if you just have questions, let us know. We'll help you find the answers. For today's service, you can find a discussion guide by selecting Watch from the top menu of our website. And now let's join our service. Well, today uh, we are wrapping up our summer series, Love, Dates, and Heartbreaks. And if this is your first time here, while I am so glad that you decided to join us for this message, uh, I'm not going to lie, it's a little like sneaking into the last few minutes of the movie. Uh, You see the epic conclusion, but you've missed all of the lead up to the epic conclusion. Uh, Hopefully you'll be intrigued enough today to check out the entire movie. Uh, You can binge all of the other episodes on our YouTube channel or through our website. Uh, We started the series talking about two relationship myths that, that in the light of day we recognize to be myths, but most of the time. They operate in the dark, influencing our decisions and the the direction we take in our relationships. The first one, the the right person myth, is the idea that once I meet Mr. Right or Miss Right, everything will be all right, including me. You see, here in the light of day, we know that it's not true. Meeting Mr. or Miss Right doesn't fix anything in our lives. We still have our insecurities. We carry them and all of our bad habits into every relationship. The right person myth doesn't change any of that. It just lets us focus on something else for a while. Now, the second myth is the promise myth. All you need for a healthy, long-term relationship is a promise and a party. I do, that's the promise, and a party or a reception, as we civilized folks call it. Then you're good to go. A promise and a party trump the need to prepare. Again, it's it's a myth. And then we checked out Jesus' new command in all of our relationships, not just in the context of love and romance. Jesus told those of us who follow him to love each other just as I have loved you. Not to love as you've been loved, not to love as you want to be loved, not to love by the benchmarks we see in our culture, but a whole new kind of love. Love by taking our cues from Jesus. Love the way he loved you, me, us. As we've already seen in this series, that kind of love changes everything. 
From there, we looked at how the Apostle Paul unpacked this kind of love in the real world, where the rubber meets the road in our day-to-day relationships. He gave us the fine print of this new love command from Jesus. But just like everything Jesus is different from everything around us, this fine print isn't the gotcha kind of fine print, but the fine print that will make you fine. And then I took this fine print out a little further and applied it specifically to the context of dating. I gave you five rules for dating that were technically made up. Don't worry, no lab rats were harmed during the beta tests. But since, since the Bible doesn't talk about dating at all, I wanted to connect the dots of these love principles we had been talking about for all of the daters. And then last week, we talked about groundhog dating and how to make sure that the next time is better than the last time instead of just like the last time when you were dating, which means that instead of approaching dating the same way, hoping for a different conclusion, we talked about dating in a different direction, doing something different, which catches everyone up, mostly. I'm sure there are a few blanks you'll want to fill in later. Uh, So we've talked about love, we've talked about dating, and today we're going to wrap up the series by talking about heartbreaks. I'm going to very carefully approach the subject of heartbreaks. Heartbreaks come in all, all sorts of shapes and sizes, not just with regards to dating and romance and relationships. As we've learned together over the past couple of years, we can grieve any loss, which means you might be grieving the loss of a dream the loss of a job. You might be experiencing heartache over the decisions one of your kids is making. Maybe something that's, uh, that's been done to you. Uh, whatever it is, if you're in a season of heartbreak right now, I want to be sensitive to any pain that you might be feeling. Too many preachers stand up and make glib, empty, patronizing promises to people in pain. And I suppose they mean well, but nobody wants to put lipstick on a pig. And no matter how you dress it up, it's still ugly and it's hard. So if you're in a season of pain, I'm sorry. And no matter what else you might get from this message today, I want you to leave with two things. First, a broken heart doesn't mean that you're broken. A broken heart doesn't mean that you're broken. Don't let your broken heart break you. Don't let it leave you broken. Don't let it break your spirit. We've all seen people who have experienced pain and let it break them. Let it define them in unhealthy ways. And I don't want that to be you. A broken heart doesn't mean that you're broken. And the second thing that I want you to take away today is this. There is purpose for you, even when your dreams can't come true. There are dreams that we wish and hope for and that we hope will come true. And and then we come to a place where we begin to realize that it will only ever be a dream. That not only is it not coming true, but it can't ever come true. And I don't want the can't ever come true dreams to squeeze the life out of you, to steal your hope or your purpose. That's why even talking about this is hard. Our dreams are so personal. Growing up, all we do is dream about what life will look like when we grow up. We enter adulthood with hopes and expectations that we've been thinking about and dreaming about for a long time. And and even if we don't have the specifics, we have a general idea. So many of us, if if we think about it, step into adulthood with a schedule in our minds. We're gonna graduate at a certain time, get married between the ages of 18 and 25, or 25 and 35 nowadays. Uh, you, You kind of had a range in mind, not too early, not too late, just right. And, and you also had an idea of what your career, would, your career path would look like. You'd be running the company by such and such an age. You'd have kids by such and such an age, retire at such and such an age. Of course, it didn't help that every time you went home on some break, you were asked, have you found that someone special yet? Picture the quintessential church lady in your mind. Every time I I was home from college, she asked me if I'd found the girl of my dreams, implying that I couldn't be fulfilled until I found her, which contributes to the pressure because (laughs) if you think about it, no one envisions their future alone. No five-year-old little girl dresses up like a princess and thinks, I'll rule my kingdom alone. 
There's always a prince, always a princess. There is somebody else in your picture of the future. It's totally normal. And as time goes by, some of our dreams come true, don't they? And then some of our dreams come true for a while. Uh, but then at some point, I think most of us realize that to some degree, there are dreams that we've had or hopes or wishes that we've had that can't come true. And sometimes, if we take a moment to be honest with ourselves, sometimes our dreams don't come true and it's our fault. Uh, we just, sometimes we end up with a broken heart and we're partially to blame. But even still, you might be the exception who followed all of the rules, dotted all of your I's and crossed all of your T's and still ended up with a broken heart. Or maybe romantically speaking, a relationship just never came into the picture. Mr. or Miss Wright never came along. Or maybe it looked promising for a while. You thought this, this could be the one that works out and then it didn't. You got that phone call or text, had that it's not you, it's me conversation. You did everything right and now they just want to be friends. And since you were more than friends just last week, being friends seems impossible. Maybe your second marriage is beginning to look and feel a lot like your first marriage. And uh, some of you are thinking, second marriage? I'd kind of like to get one under my belt, please. And maybe that's one of the things that drives you crazy. Your friends keep getting another chance at love and you're watching them mess it up with bad decisions over and over again, doing things you know you'd never do. If you could only get one chance, they don't deserve it, but they are still living your dream. You want to be happy, but life just hasn't worked out the way you hoped. And all around you, your friends' hopes and dreams and wishes just keep working out in their favor, leaving you feeling like a fifth wheel and lonely. Now, if any of that describes the season of life you find yourself in right now, here's what I want you to know. I'm sorry. It's hard. It's gut-wrenching. There's no easy way out. No easy button to push to make everything right. There are no emotionally satisfying answers and nothing will magically take your pain away. Heartbreaks are heartbreaking. And when your dreams don't come true, it's normal to feel heartbroken. So, I'm sorry. Uh, for those of you who are Christ followers, what I'm going to say next is for you. I I'm not saying it to make you feel better. It doesn't change any of the pain right now. But if you are a Christ follower, I want to speak a little perspective into your situation. There's something that you should know that frames this whole conversation, your heartbreak, the dreams that can't come true, the dreams that you don't feel are ever going to, to come true. If you are a Christian, you are in good company. The men and women who were the first Christ followers, the people who helped introduce the world to the teachings of Jesus, the men and women who literally shaped Western civilization as we know it, were no strangers to broken hearts and broken dreams. Dreams that would not, could not come true. As it turns out, they weren't cursed, they were actually blessed. They weren't broken, they were actually chosen. As Pastor Andy Stanley, who gave us the rights for this series says, they did not choose the hand they were dealt, but they chose to trust the hand that dealt it. Which doesn't mean that they didn't struggle like we do. They had the same kinds of questions that we have. They had the same kinds of conversations with God that we do. God, you could have done this differently. God, you could have done for me what you did for her. God, you could have done for me what you did for him, but you chose not to. And yet these extraordinary men and women accepted the hand that they were dealt because they trusted the hand that dealt it. And it changed, they changed the world because of it. Listen, even with dreams that can't come true, even with a broken heart, there is always purpose for your life if you keep your heart and mind open to our Heavenly Father who chooses to accomplish His perfect will through brokenhearted people. Maybe the second or third most famous person ever who experienced this is someone we've all heard of, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary was on the cusp of a long-awaited, a long-anticipated future when she found out that her life was not going to play out the way that she had always thought it would. Her life was going to be turned upside down. Her reputation in the community would be shot. And then, very shortly after Jesus was born, when he was just days old, when it looked like everything was going to work out the way that she had adjusted her plan to, a prophet came onto the scene. 
She and Joseph were just finishing up at the temple, consecrating Jesus, their firstborn, as the law required. And on their way out, the, the prophet Simeon, a very, very old man, made a beeline to them. And he took Jesus into his arms and he praised God for Jesus and what he meant for the nation of Israel. And Mary and Joseph are enjoying the holiness of the moment. And as Simeon hands Jesus back, he blesses Mary and Joe and he says to Mary, he, he blessed them and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. And as a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Okay, so far, so good. And a sword will pierce your very soul. Wait a minute. That's not what's supposed to happen. My coffee mug says that the plans God has for me are not to harm me, but to bless me. I even have the verse on a plaque on the wall so that I can see it when I come home. No, here's God's word to you. A sword will pierce your own soul. But you haven't been abandoned. You're not cursed. You're blessed among women. Now, I'd imagine that her response in that moment was the same as it had been just over nine months earlier. I am the Lord's servant. And then there's John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, loved by Jesus, who introduced Jesus to the world, set the stage for Jesus, got everything prepared so that when Jesus showed up, everything would be ready for him. And then when John realizes that his 15 minutes of fame were coming to a close, and not just any end, but a very violent end, he responded to the few people left in his circle when they brought it to his, to his attention. He said, no one can receive anything unless, it, unless God gives it from heaven. A person can only know this is not my plan. I didn't think it would play out this way. I thought I'd be beside him to the end. I'd see the return of the king, the restoration of Israel. But if this is the plan God has for me, a person can only receive from what is given to him from heaven. Or how about Jesus? Jesus. On the night of his arrest, this, this story is very familiar to many of us, he was kneeling in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, God, if I wrote the script, the script wouldn't look like this. If I got to choose my plan for the future, it wouldn't look like this. But if you could just take this cup from me, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. You know, we've, we've all seen people push back and resist, even panic when they realize their heart's broken and their dreams aren't coming true. Maybe this has even been a part of your story. I, I've seen people begin to allow fear to inform their decisions. They're in the middle of a heartbreak and as they realize their dreams aren't coming true, that God isn't answering their prayers the way he want, they want him to, they just lose faith and give up and say yes to anyone and say yes to anything, say yes to the next opportunity, even when they know it's not the best opportunity, even when they know it isn't the wise thing to do in that season of life. I've seen people try to make things happen, try to force God's hand, and you know how that works out. And again, maybe that's been part of your story. Desperation leads to despair. On the other hand, I've also seen some pretty incredible people People who had dreams, but saw the writing on the wall, so to speak. And those dreams weren't coming true as they'd hoped. Their lives weren't playing out as they'd planned. And somehow, they remained open and available to the possibilities that God had for them, even though it was different, didn't line up with their plans for their lives. Like those first men and women of faith, these people somehow mustered up the faith to trust the one who dealt them a different hand than they wanted. They were able to somehow resist something that I think all of us have a little bit of in us. Part of our problem is that we all have a little bit of prosperity gospel in us. The prosperity gospel is if you give God one, he'll give you ten. If you do this, then God will do that. If you keep your side of the bargain, God will keep his side of the bargain. Again, I think there's a little bit of prosperity gospel in all of us. Since I did then God must. I mean, isn't this just a bargaining chip, an equation, the way life works? I do the right thing, and then right things happen for me. 
If you were raised with this version of Christianity, you've already discovered that it's a very easy, it's very easy to walk away from it because it's very difficult to remain faithful to God when he doesn't uphold his end of the bargain. It's easy to leave the version of Christianity that teaches that God doesn't allow bad things to happen to good people. That God doesn't exist no matter how much we want, might want him to be like that at times. That's never been our God. That's not the God that Jesus introduced to the world. That version of Christianity wasn't the original version. In fact, at the very center of Christianity, we find the best possible person and the worst possible thing happened to the best possible person. Jesus didn't come to offer us quid pro quo. He didn't offer us an equation. He offered us an invitation. He invited us to lose our lives so that we could find life. And then he modeled it for us by laying down his life. His invitation is to follow me. Follow me not because of what he would do, but because of what he had already done. What he has already done for you. His invitation hasn't changed since he gave it. It's still the same. It's the invitation that so many brokenhearted people have said yes to. People whose dreams would not, could not come true. But here's what they found. This is beyond incredible. They discovered that this is the place where peace is found, where striving ends. This is how you live your life with your hands wide open. Even when your dreams won't come true and your heart is broken, it's the invitation to live like Jesus. Thy will, not my will, be done. These are the people who changed the world. These are the people who capture the attention of other people because these are the people whose lives carry a sense of inner peace, the kind of peace that the, the Apostle Paul says surpasses all human comprehension, which means it just doesn't make sense. King David of David and Goliath fame, we've all heard of him. David summarizes this whole idea probably better than anyone or anything else in the Old or New Testament. But in order for what he says toward the end of his life to make sense, we need to know the story. David steps onto the pages of history as a shepherd boy. He's just a kid. One day, the prophet Samuel comes to town and in front of David's whole family says, David, God has chosen you to be the next king of Israel, which is great in principle, exciting even. But there's just one hitch. Israel already has a king who happens to like being king. So, when, so David just heads back to the sheep until his father sends him for news from his brothers. They are with King Saul at the battlefront, and it's been a month. They haven't heard anything. He arrives on scene, this part of the story most of us know the gist of. He arrives on scene and Goliath is taunting the Israelites just as he has been for the past month. They, they are shaking in their boots. Fear has immobilized the entire army. And David has a different perspective. He's like 15 or 16 and he recognizes that between, beneath the bravado, Goliath is actually taunting God himself, which doesn't work for David. God is bigger than a tiny little giant man. So David marches on down and slays a giant, which changes the trajectory of his life. Now he's a household name, a legend that keeps growing battle after battle until he's accepted into King Saul's family. Saul offers him one of his daughters in marriage. And in the back of his head, he already knows that he's the next king. And now he's married to the king's daughter. He's set. For life until reality sets in for Saul <laughs> what has he done was this a big mistake the people love David more than they love Saul and they're gonna love David more than they love Saul's son and Saul wants his son Jonathan to be the next king Saul loses his mind and becomes an angry man walking he tries to kill David making David flee the city, leaving everyone and everything he knows. He, he can't go home. That would put his own family in danger, and, and that would be the first place they'd look. 
So he's on, on the run, a fugitive, alone and abandoned with a dream that looks like it's slipping away. His heart is broken and he doesn't know what to do. And he panics. He gets to the little village of Nob, a village populated primarily by priests. And he, he finds his friend Ahimelech, a priest. And he lies. Ahimelech sees him and says, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? That's strange. Here's exactly how it went. The king has sent me on a private matter, David said. It's top secret. He told me not to tell anyone why I'm, in, why I'm here. I've told my men where to meet me later. Now, what is there to eat? Give me five loaves of bread or anything else you have. We don't have any regular bread, the priest replied. But there is the holy bread, which you can have if your young men have not slept with any women recently. Don't worry, David replied. I never allow my men to, to be with women when we are on a campaign. And since they stay clean, even on ordinary trips, how much more on this top secret one? Since there was no other food available, the priest gave him the holy bread, the bread of the presence that was placed before the Lord in the tabernacle. It had been just replaced that day with, a fresh, with fresh bread. And then almost as an aside, we learned that now Doeg, the Edomite, Saul's chief herdsman, was there that day, having been detained before the Lord. Okay, thanks for that information. And back to David. David asked Ahimelech, do you have a spear or sword? The king's business was so urgent that I didn't even have time to grab a weapon. I only have the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, the priest replied. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. Take that if you want it, for there is nothing else here. Ah, oh, there's nothing like it, David replied. Give it to me. You know, if I had to guess, I'd say that something wasn't quite adding up for Ahimelech, but what can he do? This is David, giant slayer David, son-in-law of the king David. Come on. You really forgot your sword? That makes no sense at all, but David clearly sold it. So Ahimelech hands him Goliath's sword, the symbol of God's faithfulness, a reminder that God made David a promise, a reminder that even when life didn't make sense, David could trust God, though all of that was lost on David in the moment. He just panics and lies kind of what we tend to do when our hearts are broken and it seems like life is slipping out of our control. We say what we need to say to make sure that we get our way. That's where David was in the moment. He wasn't looking back at his life. He was looking forward to a big, scary, dark future, a hopeless future, so hopeless that he decided to take matters into his own hands. Oh, there's, there's nothing like it. I will cling to the security this sword gives me. And as he handed it over, that simple trusting action sealed Ahimelech's fate. Because Doeg, that rat Doeg, who will forever be memorialized as a scoundrel in Psalm 52, Doeg reports what he witnessed back to King Saul, leading Saul to show up in Nob with a small army, accusing Ahimelech of conspiring against him with his enemy. But... He's your son-in-law. He's David. Of course I aided him. I had no reason to doubt him. Why wouldn't I help him? Which only made King Saul angrier. And he had Ahimelech and every single priest in Nob and their families killed mercilessly. Even the infants, every man, woman, and child in the village because he was angry and jealous. And when David gets the news, he's devastated. Suddenly, everything about his life became even more complicated because he knew he had lied and that he was to blame for what happened in Nob. Now, time goes by. David becomes king. He has his ups and downs. He's a terrible father. His affair with Bathsheba cost him his moral authority. And now we find him in his 60s. He's in an eerily similar situation. His favorite son, Absalom, the guy who would probably be king after David died, the, the son David loved more than any of his other children. Absalom is so 
angry with his father because he did nothing when Absalom's sister Tamar was raped. So Absalom decides to undermine his father's authority. I'll let you read the story on your own. It goes on under David's nose for four years. For four years, Absalom plots and plans in secrets against his father, and then he makes his move. He raises his own army, steals the loyalty of the people, and declares himself king before marching on Jerusalem to take the throne away from David. To spare the city, the people of the city, and to spare the Ark of the, uh, the, Ark of the Covenant, David goes on the lamb. He hurriedly packs up his family, his closest friends and supporters, and abandons everything. Once again, he is a fugitive on the run, no longer a boy, but a man in his 60s at war with his son. He's already lost two. It looks like he's about to lose another and his favorite at that. And as they flee Jerusalem, the story says that the entire countryside came out to see him. They all wept aloud as he passed by as their king was leaving the city and giving up his throne leaving the city and leaving them with questions, unanswered questions about the future, insecurity, what, what would happen? David crossed the Kidron Valley, moving toward the very same wilderness he had fled to when he was much younger. Have you ever been there? All of a sudden, nothing is as it was. Your security is gone. Everything you know is gone. You're headed into a wilderness with no idea what the future holds. Even worse, have you ever felt like you were headed back into the same wilderness? But this time, there is a twist. This is what sets up what David is about to say. And here's, here's what happened. Zadok was, was there among the crowds fleeing with King David. Zadok was a priest. He and all the other priests are escorting the Ark of the Covenant out of the city with David. It seems logical to them that the Ark should stay with the king. So while David is gathering his things, Zadok gathers the priests and the Ark. Now you may or may not know that the Ark of the Covenant housed the original Ten Commandments and some other important artifacts of the early Hebrew religion. But even more than that, the Ark of the Covenant represented the very presence of God. Whoever had the Ark had God. Whoever had the Ark had the blessing of the presence of God. So Zadok thinks he's doing the right thing. The king is leaving the city. God should go with him. Take the Ark of the Covenant out of the tabernacle so it can go with the king. This is their way of saying, announcing really, he is with us. God is not with Absalom the rebel. God is with David, the true king. Everyone would know exactly what message was being sent. But David is also done manipulating and lying and panicking, trying to control the situation. He's been there, done that. First with Ahimelech and then again with Bathsheba. He'd learned his lesson. Public humiliation was for the Doegs. He was going to try this in a different direction. And so here's what he does. Then the king instructed Zadok to take the ark, the ark of God back into the city. No more manipulation, no more manipulation for me, no, no more negotiation, no more trying to force God's hand, trying to get him to do my bidding. Take the ark back to the city, back into Jerusalem. And what he says next is for you and me. Pay attention to this. David says, if the Lord sees fit, he will bring me back to see the ark and the tabernacle again. If God sees fit. If I have found favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back to see the ark in its rightful place again. I've tried it my way, and that didn't work. I've tried to force my way, and that didn't work. I've tried to cover my tracks. That didn't work. I've lied and panicked to no avail. Here I am following a plan not of my own making. This isn't how I pictured my life. I thought I knew how my story would finish out. This took me by surprise. I was surprised, but God was not. But if he is through with me, then let him do what seems best to him. 
But if God isn't pleased with me, if I've done something to bring this on myself, let him do unto me, much like Mary said so many years later, I will trust him with the outcome. This might be an interruption to my plans, but it isn't an interruption to him, to, to his. Let him do what seems best to me. And Zadok can't believe it. What? Leave the ark with your son in the city? <laughs> You're not only leaving the city, the palace, the people, but also the presence of God. How do you think that's going to work out for you? And how do you think that's going to work out for me? When this goes wrong, David, whose head will be on the chopping block? I can't abandon you, David. No, you aren't abandoning me, Zadok. Go back with my blessing. Go back to the city. And so Zadok did. He and the other priests returned the ark to the tabernacle and stayed there. David continued his journey, weeping, mourning, head covered with a broken heart. And once again, his future is dark. He's lost three sons. He's lost his dignity. None of this is playing out the way he wanted. He had lost everything. Well, except for the most important thing. He hadn't lost his confidence in God. He didn't abandon God when it seemed as if God had abandoned him. This time he didn't reach for Goliath's sword. He, he didn't take matters into his own hands. He didn't try to make something happen. He didn't anchor his faith to the fulfillment of his dreams. Because doing that just sets you up to lose confidence in God. Which brings us back to our invitation. I don't think this is really a one-time invitation, more like a daily invitation. Would you and I, like David and Mary and John and so many others, like so many people around you, people who have lost marriages, people who have lost kids, lost the opportunity to have a relationship with their grandkids, their grandkids because of decisions other people have made, that people who have lost fortunes, lost inheritances, lost partnerships, people who've lost just about anything you could imagine, would you be willing to just open your hands and declare, here are my dreams? Here are my plans. You do with them as you will. Do to me whatever seems good to you. Period. No more negotiating or manipulating or taking matters into your own hands. Just trusting those desires and dreams and plans into his hands. You know my plans, Father, but I acknowledge your right to rule. Because even if you aren't, even if your heart is broken, you aren't broken. You still have purpose. God still has purpose for you. The people who brought us the story of Jesus did not remain faithful because what they hoped would happen did happen. They remained faithful because of what had already happened, that God became flesh and dwelt among them. He was to, to demonstrate that he was on their side that he loved them, was for them to demonstrate that he is the same for you. At the center of our story is a man who deserved the best possible life and chose the worst possible end for us. It was his way of saying that even when life doesn't go your way, I still love you. I still have a plan for you. I know what's best for you. I've got this. So when your heart is broken, that's your cue. Not to run away, not to manipulate, not to take matters into your own hands, but to lean in. Look up and trust your open hands to God who has the whole world in his hands. That's the time to pray, do to me whatever seems good to you. Will you say yes to that invitation? Let's pray. Father, it's, it's easy to say those words, do to me, do unto me what you would do unto me. It's a lot harder to live them out. Father, we know that you are good and that your ways are perfect, that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts, that your ways are higher than our ways. They're not just a little bit different, they're very different. 
as different as night is from the day. Give us the courage to give up what we think of as control, to give up um, our hopes and our dreams and trust the God who knows better than we do what is best for us. Help us to truly live the invitation that Jesus gave to follow him, to give up our lives for him. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. Let me encourage you to download the discussion guide by selecting watch from the top menu of our website. Working through those questions alone or with others will help the truth of God's word find its place in your life. Please reach out if you have any questions or want help on your spiritual journey. My email address is on the screen, or you can call the church during the week. This ministry is made possible because of people like you, people who believe in what God is doing through Dayspring. Your financial generosity is evidence of God's work in your life. If you're just checking us out today, please know that we don't expect you to give anything to support Dayspring. That's the responsibility of our Dayspringers. Just enjoy the rest of your day. If you'd like to start giving, we have three easy ways for you to get us your gift. Please see the online giving section of our website or text GIVE to the number on your screen or mail a check to us at the address you'll find on our website. Also, thank you for liking and sharing and following Dayspring on whatever platform you're on, maybe even rating us where that is appropriate. It is really encouraging to me when you share something that has impacted you through this service with someone else. Until we meet again, may the God of all peace give you peace at all times and in every situation.